I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna Press Review, the show in which we go through the back pages, we scour the internet for the latest Arsenal-related transfer stories and we bring them to the table. We'll also discuss some of the big ones involving some of the other clubs that might have an impact on us in some way, shape or form. Uh, we're going to be breaking down some of the stories, as I say, doing the rounds today and also the knock-on effect that some of the reported transfers might have on the current squad. We're going to be talking about the right back position. We're going to be talking about the future of Takahiro Tomiyasu, not in terms of whether he'll be at the club or not. I think we can all agree that he's been a very good signing. But what does his future role look like in this squad? We'll also be touching on William Saliba as well. So lots and lots to get into. Big hello to everybody joining us in the live chat at the moment. Hope you're all well. Don't forget to hit that like button if you haven't done so already. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're still creeping closer towards that 20K mark. And the quicker we get there, the better. So please do uh, subscribe to the channel if you're new. If you're listening via audio, of course, big hello to you guys as well. Please do leave us a review. That really does help also. OK, let's kick off then running through some of these stories. Um, I'm going to touch on a couple of stories, uh, a couple of reports that have been doing the rounds that we were already aware of. Um, and that is, uh, of course, that Arsenal, who reportedly have an interest in Tammy Abraham, uh, will have to pay around 80 million euros to land the player from Roma. Now, there's been a lot of confusion within the Arsenal fan base over the last week or so when we've been talking is Tammy Abraham owned by Roma? Is Tammy Abraham owned by Chelsea? He is owned by Ch uh, by Roma, I beg your pardon. So any fee uh, payable would be to Roma. But of course, Chelsea have a, I think it's a first refusal clause um, on Tammy Abraham. And they have as well an option to buy him back for a set amount uh, as well. So um, you'd have to imagine or assume or, or believe that Chelsea won't be looking to go back in for Tammy Abraham for that deal to be possible, for that deal to be viable. But 80 million euros feels a little bit steep for me. I talked about it yesterday on the show that we did, uh, on both shows that we did with Tom Canton and with Mike Stavrou, about the fact that I feel like Tammy Abraham's physical attributes, his, sp his speed across the ground, his strength, his presence, all of that kind of makes him seem like a better player in the Serie A, but I think we've already seen in the Premier League that he can be quite hit and miss. That's not to say he's a bad footballer and that I'd be dead against the idea of signing him because I'm not, but I wouldn't pay 80 million euros for him. I don't believe he has a ceiling high enough to justify an 80 million euro fee. Um, lots of people have been very complimentary of his record in Italy this season. And why not? He scored 15 times in 33 Serie A appearances as well as contributing four assists. So he's certainly making an impact there. But I think we've seen in the Premier League that Tammy Abraham is a good level striker, but not quite at that elite level. Would Chelsea have sold him? If he was, um, I know they've made mistakes in the transfer market in the past. There's been a, a number of uh, high profile players that they've allowed to leave who, you know, you could look back on and say were, were bad decisions. But um, I, I just think 80 million euros is too much for Tammy Abraham. And I don't really see him wanting to leave Rome after such a short period of time in which he's been a success there. The lifestyle is great. You're playing for one of the biggest clubs in Italy. Um, you know, I think in playing in a, in the Italian league and, and really sort of showing himself in a good light, he increases his chances of getting into the England setup rather than coming to the Premier League and getting lost in a sort of pool of talent that he just isn't capable of standing out in, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, that's where I am on Tammy Abraham. But that's a report from Football.London. Arsenal will have to pay 80 million euros for Tammy Abraham. Too much for me. The other bit uh, that I just wanted to quickly touch on, and again, it's a report and a story that we already know about, is to do with Gabriel Jesus. Now, Gabriel Jesus, again, popped up on the score sheet for Manchester City last night during their semi-final first leg victory over Real Madrid at the Etihad. He scored the second goal 
Um, really good performance from him again. We already knew that the talks are, have supposedly taken place between Arsenal and Jesus' representatives. We already know that Manchester City are open to the idea of selling the player this summer and Goal have just uh, reiterated that story. Uh, as they say, Manchester City and Brazil striker Gabriel Jesus has begun talks with the Arsenal. So they're backing up the story that's already come out. The new piece of news and the new report and the new link that I wanted to touch on today is uh, with regards to the Udinese right-back, Nahuel Molina, Argentine fullback, And according to reports in Italy, Il Messaguero, to be specific, Arsenal are preparing to make a move for the fullback. Uh, apparently, according to the initial report, he's also being eyed up at the moment by Juventus and Atletico Madrid, which makes things, of course, um, far more difficult, particularly when you think like Diego Simeone is an Argentine legend, right? It, it must be easier for him to sort of get into the ears of um, of Argentine players and, and sort of make those deals happen, make those deals come to fruition, convince them that that is the right place for them. Now, just to give you a bit of a, a sort of download on uh, Nahuel Molina, uh, I just want to share with you his uh, transfer marked page. Um, and of course, you can go and check this out yourself, but I just wanted to bring you up to speed with it. Now, he is a player who's only really emerged over the last sort of year or so in terms of being at the level required uh, and, and somebody that's caught the eye in this area. 30 appearances uh, so far this season, six goals and four assists. That's pretty good for a fullback. Talking about a right back, he's 24 years old, so he fits. Um, I beg your pardon, have I got the sound on on that site? No, shouldn't have. Uh, have I? Let me know in the chat. I just see someone saying the adverts are playing, are they? Let me... Um, I thought I had it on mute, but let me... Um, yeah, I think it's on mute. I don't think it's that site. Is it? Maybe it is. I beg your pardon. Uh, for those of you listening, thank you for letting me know in the chat. Um, yeah, there was a video playing at the bottom of the page. But yeah, going back to uh, Nahuel Molina, 24 years old, so he fits into that perfect um, bracket of player who isn't too, too young, isn't too inexperienced, um, but also is at a point in his career where he's still got lots of room to grow, lots of room to develop. He clearly has an impact going forward. Six goals is not to be sniffed at for a right back and four assists as well is pretty positive. Um, he's participated in 20% of Udinese's league goals this season. And all of that from right back. Now, he also, according to Transfer Mark, has the capability to play at left back too. Now, that is not his strongest position. It's not his best position. But, um, you know, the fact that we've had a few question marks around the left back position in Kieran Tierney's absence as well. Well, it won't be uh, or it won't do any harm, will it, to have somebody else who can slot in in that position when the Scotsman is unavailable. So this is a, a, a deal that I like the look of. But what's interesting to me is that according to Il Messaguero, he's been valued at around about um, 25 million euros. 25 million euros is is a lot of money for a player that transfer marked uh, value at 9 million. His current contract at the club, though, is due to expire in 2026. Um, so that's that 2026 is, is a long time, you know. So there's a lot of time on that contract. And Udinese have been very uh, sort of good at doing this in order to sort of tie down players to kind of ensure that they get the fee that they want if they do decide to cash in on him. So given that that contract still has plenty of time to run, you're not going to get him on the cheap. 25 million euros, though, feels a little bit excessive to me, uh, given what we know about the player at this moment in time. But then this takes me on nicely to the other bit I wanted to talk about, because Nahuel Molina clearly being heavily linked with a move to Arsenal. If Arsenal are going to go and spend 25 million euros on a right back, what does that mean for Takahiro Tomiyasu? What does it mean for William Saliba? And I'll tell you how William Saliba gets drawn into this conversation as well. And for me, it's quite simple. Now, well, Molina comes in. Is he going to come in to replace Cedric? I don't know. I think that the idea would be that he's an upgrade on Cedric, but is he someone that you would spend? Would you spend 25 million? million euros, if that's what it's going to take to get him away from Udinese for someone who's going to play the Cedric role, given that we clearly need 
one, maybe two strikers, that we need a further addition in centre midfield and that we probably need another winger as well. Taking all of that into consideration, can we afford to spend such a big amount of money on a backup right back? I don't think so. The thing that came into my mind as soon as I saw this was, well, does this indicate that in Arteta's mind, if indeed this is true and if indeed this is a move that Arsenal make, does this indicate that he sees Takahiro Tomiyasu in the future as a centre-back as opposed to a right-back? Now, if you think back through Tomiyasu's career, he's not really played at right-back regularly prior to coming to Arsenal. He's done a fantastic job there, not taking anything away from him. And I think in a lot of ways, he's he's helped the balance of the team in that we can be that little bit more aggressive because of his ability to tuck in as a centre-back and to tuck in and help out in a more narrow shape. I think he's also been very useful when teams have tried to aerially bombard us. And he has had to uh, sort of tuck in closer to Ben White and help out from an aerial perspective. If I had one criticism, one criticism of Takahiro Tomiyasu, and even this feels harsh, it's that when he gets into the final third, I don't think he always makes the right decisions. And I don't always think that he's got that technical ability or that composure to look up, pick someone out um, and to, to make the right decision when in that area of the pitch. Nahuel Molina, looking at those statistics, looking at the fact that this guy from right back in a in a poor Udinese side, let's be honest, you know, they're not a great side, but has contributed, um, you know, as many as six goals and four assists, suggests to me that he offers plenty uh, in an attacking sense. And I say this is an average Udinese side because they're 12th in the Serie A. They're not going down. They're not in any danger of that, but they're certainly not. I don't think, going to finish in the top half. They're not knocking on the door of Europe. This is a side that haven't been all that great this season as a whole. Um, and Nahuel Molina is is popping up and contributing going forward. Is he as good as Takahiro uh, Tomiyasu defensively? No, not a chance. And, and I will have nobody tell me any different. He is not at the same level um, from a defensive point of view. But going forward, he gives a lot more. When Mikel Arteta has the team he wants, when everybody's fit, when everybody's available, is the plan to move to a more progressive fullback like somebody um, in the, the mould of Molina and then for Tommy Asu to come inside and be a centre-back that we can call upon? I don't know. Um, and I think that naturally you'd want a right-back, wouldn't you, that, that is all-encompassing, that can do all of those things. But I think that if you put a right-back, a more traditional right-back into that side and a more traditional Left back comes back in, um, uh, you know, such as, uh, such as, um, I beg your pardon, Kieran Tierney. Then all of a sudden, the balance of the whole team changes because now we have a right back who tucks in, is a little bit more reserved, a little bit more conservative, and that allows the left back to bomb on that little bit more. And I actually think that with Tommy Asu coming back into the side. Um, that, for me, is um, it is going to help Nuno Tavares because he gets to play a little bit further forward and he gets to be a little bit more adventurous without being uh, as pinned back and as rooted to his, um, to his defensive position. I think when you look at the way that Arsenal have, have defended in the last couple of games where it's been Cedric and Tavares, you know, at Chelsea, we, we sort of switched it into a back three at times and that helped with the stability issue, but we've looked really unstable for me. So I, there's a reluctance in my mind uh, to go to a more traditional right-back. The fact that to Tomiyasu is a centre-back slash right-back slash right centre-back actually helps us quite a bit in terms of maintaining the right level of balance in the team between defence and attack. So I'm reluctant to move away from what's worked. I really, really am. But I don't know what Mikel Arteta's long-term plan is. And if we are indeed interested in Molina of Udinese, that suggests to me that he wants somebody who's a little bit more progressive and is a little bit more of a, a sort of standard uh, right fullback in the modern day than Takahiro Tomiyasu. But then the reason I come on to talk about William Saliba is if Tomiyasu is then, let's assume that that theory is correct, let's assume that that's the way that Mikel sees it. What does the future hold 
for William Saliba. And then is it any surprise that we've seen reports over the last few days suggesting that Arsenal might look to sell him this summer? It's it's a really, really interesting thing. And I think actually if, if Arsenal do go out and bring in um, another right back this summer and a right back in the mould, in the shape of Molina, I think that that really does give us an indication as to what the future holds positionally for Tomiyasu and with regards to where William Saliba is going to be. So this this right back position, it fascinates me and I'm really, really interested to see how this is going to develop, how this is going to pan out, how this is going to shape up. Um, let me know your thoughts in the chat. I will take some of your thoughts on this in just a second. But Arsenal, as I say, uh, according to Il Messaguero in Udinese, linked with Nahuel Molina, the Argentine fullback who currently plays his football at Udinese. According to reports, he's valued by his current employers at around about 25 million euros. Can Arsenal spend 25 million euros on a backup right back? Or will we see Tommy Asu's position change? Or, um, uh, sorry, and with Tommy Asu's position potentially changing, does that mean the end of William Saliba's Arsenal career? Even though never really got going. I don't know. Lots to think about, lots to mull over. Let's take some of your thoughts uh, from the live chat box as well. But just before I do that, I just want to bring you guys' attention uh, to our partners over at Football Prizes who have got, yep, you've guessed it, another Arsenal-related football prize up for grabs. And it's an Alexander Lacazette signed and framed Arsenal shirt. And there's also the opportunity to win eight instant win prizes. Um, I'll take you through what those are. They're a Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang signed and custom framed Arsenal shirt, a Liam Brady signed and framed Arsenal montage, some Arsenal club shop vouchers and some football prizes site credit. Now there are 199 tickets available. They're priced at £2.95 a piece. Uh, there are five days remaining on this competition. So this runs uh, until the 20, uh, I beg your pardon, the 2nd of May, not the 22nd, the 2nd of May at 7.30 p.m. Um, so five days, six hours, 41 minutes remaining on this at the time of recording. 100 of the 199 tickets available, though, have already been sold. So... Um, if you do uh, want to get involved in this, then jump on it ASAP. Um, Selgaeus says, is football prizes only available to UK residents? I tried to get tickets, but it didn't let me. I believe it is, mate. Um, so apologies if it doesn't apply to you. Um, but it is a fantastic prize. If you are UK based and you want to get involved, then do check it out. Um, let's take some of your thoughts. Let's take some of your comments um, on on this subject and, and anything else, really, as we move into sort of a Q&A part uh, of this show. Um, Alejandro says, will we see the monkey tail beard at 20K? Do you know what? I'll try it if we get there. <laughs> um, John Daly says, we will spend about 10 million plus Pablo Marie, maybe. Yeah, you know what? That's a fantastic point. And it completely slipped my mind, even though I had it on my paper um, as something to mention. Obviously, Pablo Marie is there on loan. And there's been um, sort of talks of Udinese's desire to keep him. So when they say that he's valued at 25 million euros, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have to spend that to get him. And that's a really, really good point. Could Pablo Marie, who's voiced his um, sort of uh, desire to remain in Italy, uh, could that be used as a make way in this deal? And is that why? Arsenal feel like this is a player that would be worthwhile signing. It's a really, really good point. And I did know that for some reason, I uh, completely overlooked it when we were talking about the price. But even still, even still, would you give up Pablo Marie plus, um, you know, 10, 15 million, whatever it is to make up what Udinese value uh, Nahuel Molina at for a backup fullback? I think the point still stands that this could be um, a deal that we do with a view to uh, maybe Tommy Asu's position slightly changing, and then that can have a knock-on effect, can't it, on um, on William Saliba as well. Uh, Social DRG says it means we have diversity in our players, and that's what we need for European football. Saliba can play multiple positions. Tommy Asu can, even White can. Yeah, it's a good point. It's always good to have versatile players, but I'm always afraid, particularly when players are at a young age and still developing, that they're going to end up being jacks of all trades and masters of none. That's what I don't want. And I think that we've seen that happen with a few players. I think that Maitland-Niles is a prime example of someone who 
um, never really settled in the position he wanted. I'd argue that he probably wouldn't have had the career he's had so far if he wasn't so versatile. So it can be seen as a positive as well. But um, it is something that's always in the back of my mind, you know, and then it's it's difficult to judge players as well, isn't it? When they're not playing in their preferred position, how would they get on? Um, what is their actual level at? It's very, very difficult to say. Um, Wayne Francis says, I don't know, you know, remember Tommy Asu's assist to Gabby against Newcastle? Yeah, but look, that's that's an anomaly, right? We don't see Tommy Asu overlapping Bukayo Saka every single time and making the right decisions and cutting people, uh, cutting the ball back to people and picking people out on the edge of the box. He... For me, that's the one part, and he's not even bad at it, but it's the one part of his game that isn't at the highest level for me, in my personal opinion. Um, some bloke also says we need a different type of option at right back than Tommy Asu gives you options based on the opposition. I completely agree with that. And in an ideal world, you'd like to stockpile players. You'd like to have quality players in every single position who offer slightly different things. The issue is here is that there are still a lot of positions, I believe, that Arsenal need to address going into the summer. And are we going to be able to do all of that if we allocate uh, part of the budget to a fullback that isn't the first choice fullback? So if we are going to do this, does it say that he is someone that Mikel believes could be the long term solution there and that Tommy Asu's future is elsewhere? Let's see what else we've got. Um Sam says horses for courses. I completely agree. For example, you go away to Liverpool, you'd probably rather Tommy Asu at right back to give you that bit of added defensive security. You play at home to Burnley, let's say, for example, and you might feel that you're better off with a fullback who can get forward on the right as well and, and being a little bit more dynamic in that sense. So you're right, horses for courses, but you need to have the options, don't you, to pick the right horses for courses. And I guess um, this would add another option even if I'm not sure um, that that it doesn't mean Tommy Asu moving elsewhere. Uh, Social says, is it more important for Arteta to sign players that can play multiple positions over one trick ponies? Or would you rather assign someone who can play one position and do it well? I think there's a balance to be found here. In an ideal world, you love players that can say, no problem, boss, I'll jump in and I'll do that job um, without any issue, without any hesitation. But I don't always think that you're going to find that. I, I really don't. I think there's going to be times where, um, you know, you you sort of compromise on on someone's ability to play in one position to get that flexibility and to get that, um, what's the word, versatility. And, and it depends what you want to do, I guess. it's. Um, I think it's nice to have those players, but those players, the players that can really do that and do that very, very well, they're hard to come by. They're a rarity. They're not something that you find every day, I don't think, anyway. So I think you can't be obsessed with looking for those players. I think if you find players that can do that, then great, it's a bonus. But um, but I think to to actively look for those players, I think, is really difficult. And um, and I think, as I say, that versatility can come at a cost in the sense of you might not then be a specialist or as good as you can be when in the position that you were primarily brought into play. Um, so that would be my view on that. Uh, FTL Guna Craig says, with Udinese wanting Marie permanently, do you see a potential player plus cash deal for Molina? As we've, we've touched on, I think that is um, that is a real possibility for sure. Um, just touching on the, the Saliba thing, because, um, you know, I've, I've been criticised quite a bit um, in the past for... Um, you know, for suggesting that the idea of selling William Saliba isn't as outrageous as some people make it out to be. Uh, and Jay, interestingly, says if we get a 45 to 50 million pound offer for Saliba, I'd sell him straight away, especially if he doesn't want to come back to Arsenal and fight for his place. Now, it's really up in the air, this William Saliba thing. I don't really know what's going to come of it. I don't know if he's going to end up back at the football club. And if he does come back, even for a season, I don't know if he's going to be happy in the role that I imagine him having, which is going to be waiting to get in ahead of a White or a Gabriel. Now, we're going to have European football, and that means, or we think, we hope, and that means that he's going to get more game time naturally, and we're going to need a bigger squad, and we're going to need more players of a higher calibre. But what I would say um, and why Jay's point makes some sense to me is that 
you might value him now at 45, 50 million pounds because he's gone to Marseille and had a good a good spell. Now, I still don't think he's worth 45, 50 million pounds. I think if you got 30 million pounds, something in the region of what we paid for him, that would be enough to at least make me consider a sale. But I think the interesting thing here is that if he then returns to Arsenal, is a bit part player, um, clearly is unhappy, clearly isn't uh, breaking into the team and isn't showing himself at the level that maybe we saw at Marseille, maybe through a lack of opportunities, then all of a sudden he's not a 30, 35 million pound player, not a 45, 50 million pound player, as Jay says either. And then you you then look to move him on the next season. He's got one year less on his contract, which impacts the value and he's not really played and he's not at his peak in terms of um, how people view him. And all of a sudden that value can diminish quite quickly. So I think that if the right offer is there, I don't, as I say, Jay, I don't think it would be as much as 45 to 50 million pounds. But if that sort of money was on the table, I'd consider it for sure. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, going back to Molina, Tom says, seems like a different profile than Tommy and allows us to be flexible with subs and the system uh, changes more of a Cedric replacement, in my opinion. Yeah, but it's it's only really... I only th I think that Arsenal can only afford to, to meet a 25 million euro valuation for a fullback if he is seen as someone who's going to play a much bigger role than Cedric. Now, Cedric has played of late because of injury. Cedric has played because we've been on our knees and because this Tommy Asu saga has gone on and on and on and on and on. But I don't believe Cedric's role, you know, I, I don't think Cedric would have started a single game um, had Tommy Asu been fit. And I don't think that Cedric would have come on in a single game had Tommy Asu been fit. You know, you could argue that in some of the games where we've moved, um, you know, Rob Holding into the centre of the defence to make it a five when we've been defending something that you could just shuffle Tommy Asu over and move Cedric in at right back. But I think that weakens us defensively as opposed to bringing Holding into the middle and then leaving Tommy Asu at right back in a five. So I don't think that Cedric, as I say, had it not been for Tommy Asu's injury, would have any look in, not as a sub, not as a starter, not as anything. He would just be a bit part player, very much a bit part player, making up the numbers. And I just think that unless you're going to get, as we've discussed, something for Pablo Marie, and that makes this deal doable for a, a much lower figure. And I don't think it's it's necessarily worthwhile. But, um, you know, we'll see how this pans out and and, and see what the knock-on effect is, of course. Um, Eli M says, hi, Harry. Thoughts on Milan's Rafael Leao. He's a baller. Shame he plays on the right. Really, really like the player. But again, don't see him as somebody uh, that we're going to be looking at this summer, if I'm completely honest. I think he's, um, I think he's someone who is very much on the up. I think it would be unwise for him to leave this area at this point in his career. I I always think that the Premier League appeals to people, not just because of the football, but because of the money as well. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure that Rafael Leao is someone that will be on Arsenal's radar, but I do really like the player and you're right to, uh, to bring him up. He is brilliant. Let's take a few more. Um, of your questions. This is a really good question. Would you trade Saka plus cash for Haaland? Oh, no, I don't want to lose Bukayo Saka. Um, I, I just don't want to lose him. I think he's so important to us. And I think he's someone that you need to be building around. A signing like Haaland would certainly show us to be looking to be competitive, looking to move on to that next level that would keep the likes of Saka happy as he continues to grow and he continues to develop. I wouldn't let him go um, for Haaland because I think there are other strikers out there that could come in and really sort of help this team and really take this team to the next level. I don't think like we have to become obsessed with players like Haaland. Like I think he's a good player. I really, really do. Um, and I think that under Pep Guardiola, he'll only get better if indeed that transfer happens. Um, Haaland to Manchester City, that is. But no, I, I just don't want to lose Saka at the moment. Uh, not for anything. Uh, Clock N Seb says, is the supposed £120 million transfer fund built up with expected player sales or will any outgoings bump up the wallet? I don't know, is the honest answer, Seb. Um, I, I don't even know that that is the transfer 
budget that's been allocated. Um, I don't think we'll ever know for sure. There's been summers we've gone into them where I thought we're going to really struggle here to spend big. We're going to um, be reserved in the transfer market and try and do very shrewd deals that are going to stand us in good stead um, and, and save a few quid. Because when you look at Arsenal's financial results over the last couple of years, can't help but be concerned a little bit. Um, I think that naturally, you know, Mikel Arteta will want uh, and will try and force the idea on the ownership of if we can bring in decent money for players, then it should be reinvested back in the team, particularly at this phase in the project. But there's only so much that Mikel can do in that because he's not the owner. He's not the man making decisions from a financial perspective. He's clearly got a big influence. He's clearly earned the trust of those at the top of the club and, and they've allowed him to get away with things that... I don't think, for example, Unai Emery would have ever gotten away with. Maybe not even Arsene Wenger. And that's strange when you think about all the brilliant things he did for the football club. But um, you'd have to assume that Mikel would be pushing for that um, if that was the case. But again, as I, I don't want to sort of speculate too much, Seb, but I don't know what that transfer kitty is going to look like. Um, and there's a, there's a part of me that goes into every transfer window as an Arsenal fan being prepared to be underwhelmed. And I think that the focus is on a couple of big names, big players who are going to come in and help the team uh, and take us to that next level. And I think anything else maybe would be dictated by what we're able to recuperate. Just going to take a very, very brief pause uh, and we'll be back and we'll take some more of your questions and continue for the next sort of 15, 20 minutes of the show. <laughs> Okay, let's get back to the chat box. Um, Harvey says, Harry, is it hard to attract South American players to England because of the weather and culture like Nunez? They seem to prefer Spain or Italy. I think that naturally, and, and listen, I my family are from a country where the culture is very different, where the weather is very different. And I can say to you that it does make a difference to your general happiness. It really does. Like even here, even in the UK where it's not particularly warm, when I wake up and the sun is shining, I'm in a much better mood. And like the culture is very different in that, you know, in Spain or Italy, you and the same with Cyprus, you'd go out later. Um, you'd go meet friends like they I always say this, like, I always chat about this with sort of my cousins over there and relatives. And and I know you're not talking about Cyprus, but I think it's comparable because of the climate and because of the way the culture is. Uh, to in Italy or Spain. But I always think like they finish work and they've just got this enthusiasm or uh, willingness to kind of go out and do something, go meet their friends for a coffee, even go and have a drink, go and have a meal. Whereas here in the UK, I think it's very much like you finish work and the, and that's it. And, and more than most people do when they finish work, vegetate on the couch, watch football, watch a film, whatever. Um, and I think that can be that sort of lifestyle here in London can be a little bit mundane and, and can be a little bit boring and can get you down. And I know that we're talking about elite level footballers with huge pockets who could probably afford to go out and do whatever they want to do every single night without even batting an eyelid. But I do think that that plays a part. I really, really do. So I think that it's an easier transition for a South American to go to an Italy or Spain and particularly Spain where the language is um is very uh, is the same as as most of the South American countries. I think that that does play a part, but I think the Premier League has become such a beast financially and has become such a beast in terms of its reputation in the football world that I think a lot of these guys look at it and go, "I'll go and do that for five six years, line my pockets, set myself for life, and then I will go elsewhere. I'll go to Spain. I'll go to Italy, where the tempo's a little bit slower, and I can sort of wind down uh, my career there." Uh, just going back to what we said before, Shreyas asks, can Molina play both left back and right back? Um, yeah, primarily a right back though. I'm always reluctant to say that a right back can play left back as well as a left back can play left back because you're playing on your wrong side and that has, um, that has challenges, doesn't it? Um, what else have we got? Big shout out to Kipsy Call, uh, Kipis Call now, Kipsy Call, however, I've, I always butcher your name, but thank you so, so much, mate. Um, what else have we got? Uh, there's some of you asking about tickets for the North London Derby. I honestly don't know uh, where you're going to find tickets for the North London Derby. It's so in demand. It's a game that's going to have 
potentially so much riding on it and the allocation is not very big for the Arsenal fans. I don't even know where you'd get one from a Tottenham fan um, perspective. Not that I would sit with them. I, I don't think I could bear it. But um, yeah, it's um, it's going to be tough, mate. You're probably going to have to pay way over the odds. I'll just keep checking online because I don't know of any direct links or, or people that could, could sort that out potentially. Um, but yeah check it out um check check out online i guess and just maybe ask around on twitter or whatever sometimes you never know something might c- crop up a uh, big thank you to vinny eagle who's become a youtube member thank you so so much mate um really really appreciate it and it was an absolute pleasure meeting you the other night as well at the hippodrome casino in london thank you for your support of the channel it's very very much appreciated make sure you click the community tab on the top of the youtube and uh, get the link to our Discord server, um, where uh, where you'll uh, you'll be able to get involved with everybody in that live chat. Um, what else have we got? What else have we got? We'll take a few more uh, of your thoughts and a few more of your questions. So do keep them coming. Um, Shaguna joins us from Singapore. He says uh, it's eight pm here in Singapore. I love your show. Keep it up, Harry. Great content. Thank you. Uh, so, so much. Really, really do appreciate it. Uh, Richard Barker, in response to my comment about it sort of getting dark and dull and, and everything being closed in England after a certain time, particularly in the winter months, says, uh, tell me about it. Aberdeenshire is dark from 4 p.m. until 9 a.m. in the winter. That's what I mean. Like you, you go to work, you work, you, you leave and it's dark in the morning, you get home and it's dark. And all of a sudden you don't want to do anything in the evening. And I know because I've, I've had that feeling yet. When I'm in uh, abroad, even if it's working, I still have that energy and that enthusiasm to kind of get up and and, and want to do something after even the longest of days. And that's because of the weather. That's because of the environment. Um, just adding on that as well, I, I feel like we've dived down a bit of a rabbit hole here. But GB says the UK is so fast paced during your average week with work that there may be room for a stop at your local in the evening for a couple of hours. But then it's home. Uh, lots more weekday socialization elsewhere. I completely agree with that. Um, Tired Gunasaurus says, football prizes, what number shall I pick to win, Harry? Is there a 34 for Granite Xhaka's banger against Manchester United the other day? If so, check it out. Uh, Adam Daniel says, Harry, have you been to Asia before? I have not. Um, I have not. I, I would love to go. Um, there's a lot of places I'd love to go to, but no. Uh, I've not done an Asia trip yet. Uh, Recon says 8 p.m. It's 2 a.m. in Hawaii, boys. Come on, you gunners. Big shout out to everybody joining us uh, from that part of the world as well. Uh, we'll take this question from John in just a second. But if I could just ask, if you haven't done so already, please do hit the like button. Uh, we are about 30 likes shy of that 100 mark. Let's try and get there ASAP. There's over 300 of you watching, so it should be light work. Also, just a quick reminder, if you haven't done so already, please do subscribe to the channel because uh, we are approaching that 20,000 mark and uh, want to get there ASAP. OK, let's take this one from John. Um, what's the best result for West Ham for the Arsenal game around the corner? Are you assu- are you talking about West Ham's European game, which comes up on Thursday and what the best result is in that for us, from our perspective? Um, let me know. But. I guess, I guess, um, what's the best result? Look, you want West Ham, obviously, to still be in the Eintracht Frankfurt tie. You want them to feel like they need to go um, over to Germany at their peak, at their best. I mean, if they got beaten 3-0 at home, for example, I'm sure they'd still give the second leg a go. But you want them to be right in the tie. You want them to be... In the mix, you want it to be so finely balanced that David Moyes feels that he can't possibly risk not having everyone at their best for the second leg, in which case we might see some heavy rotation in the game against Arsenal. We know that they're already without a number of central defensive options. Um, For what it's worth, as as John asks a little bit later on in the chat, I don't want West Ham to win the Europa League. No, I don't want another club to win a European trophy um, more recently than us. So, no. I don't want that to happen. I'd like them to crash out, but I'd like them to crash out in the second leg. Um, after, um, you know, after 
uh, after a, a sort of defeat against Arsenal at the London Stadium at the weekend. But yeah, as I say, I think we need West Ham to be right in the mix. We need them to be in this and we need it to be um, a result that puts David Moyes in the mindset of, I cannot possibly risk um, losing somebody against Arsenal uh, at the weekend ahead of that second leg. And, and listen, West Ham should be very much focused on the Europa League. They're not going to finish in the Champions League places. Does it really matter where they finish in the table in the context of things? Yeah, they'd like European football. I'm sure they would. Of course they would. But they've got a huge opportunity. David Moyes has got a huge opportunity to make history with that football club and win a European trophy. Because although I make RB Leipzig the favourites to go on and win the competition based on what I know of the teams, there's not a single team in there that West Ham will look at and say, well, we can't possibly beat them. So the, the, the opportunity is huge. It's massive. And um, and we can only hope that they're distracted come Sunday and we can take advantage of that. Um, sticking on the subject of West Ham, Amira says, not Arsenal related, but where do you personally see Declan Rice going after West Ham? It's hard to say, isn't it? We know he's a Chelsea boy at heart. We know that he's he grew up supporting Chelsea. We know that he played for Chelsea as a young man. But the issue is that do you, you know that move from Chelsea to West Ham? It's it's one that brings a lot of heat. There's a big, big rivalry there. Um, players have done it in the past, of course. Frank Lampard did it, West Ham to Chelsea. Joe Cole did it. Um, so there's been a number of players that have made that move. You know, the the romantic in me wants to say that Declan Rice won't make that move. I feel like Declan Rice is someone that Manchester United have probably been keeping an eye on for a little while. He's been linked with them on numerous occasions. Um, but does that change with Eric Ten Hag coming in and taking over? I don't know. We're going to have to wait and see. Um, but I don't see Declan Rice staying at West Ham much longer. And I actually think that if West Ham did go on and win the Europa League, that would be the kind of the, the signing off that Declan Rice would need to be able to leave the club as a legend and say, well, I've done what I can do here um, and now it's time to move on elsewhere. But he's a top, top player and definitely will be at a bigger club at some point. Um, what else have we got? Uh, Simi Simpson says that planning on West Ham or any other team for that matter to field a weakened team because any team, especially a reserve team, will have something to prove. No, it's, it's not to say, Simi, that we should take them lightly. It's not to say that we can't be, that we don't need to be at our best. We need to be at our best and we need to be fully focused on what it is that we need to do on the task in hand. But West Ham will be distracted and that does play a part. Like, yes, people have a point to prove, but you'd rather face certain players than their best players, wouldn't you? And that's that's only the point that we're, we're making here. Um, Christopher Chan says, would you take David Moyes at Arsenal? No. Um, I think that David Moyes is someone who is the per is in the perfect place right now. West Ham are a club big enough and with the resource enough to compete to a certain point, but without the pressure of going and winning trophies every season or playing football in a particular way. And that's why David Moyes was a great fit for Everton, not a great fit for Manchester United, and has proven himself to be a great fit for West Ham United um, of late. Um, I get this question quite a lot, but Alejandro asks, where can I buy that Arsenal cap? You can buy them from the Arsenal shop. I think you'll probably buy them online. I've got a, a black one, a grey one, a white one and a navy one. I bought the whole load uh, one day when I went into that shop and got a little bit carried away, uh, which always happens. Um, Depressed Guna says, unrelated to West Ham, but do you think Paqueta would be a good addition to Arsenal? Um I've got to be honest, I haven't seen an awful lot of him. Um, obviously, 24 years old, uh, more of an attacking midfield player, though. And that kind of, that puts me off a little bit in that I don't really think we're lacking in that area. I think that you've got Smith Rowe, you've got Odegaard. Um, I think we're probably looking for someone who's a little bit more deep lying or a little bit more of a box to box player, which would put me off Lucas Paqueta. I did see a fair bit of him during his time at Milan. Um, which is largely what my opinion is based on because I don't watch a lot of Leon. But um, I think he'd be a decent addition for anybody looking for a player of that mould. But I just don't think that that's where our priorities should be at this moment in time. But that's obviously um, my opinion. Um, 
John Daly says, are you going to the Emirates Cup this season? Plus any idea of who we're playing? I, I don't know what's happening yet, but there will be something, I'm sure. Um, I do plan on attending. I actually plan on making that the first game that I'm going to take my little boy to because at the moment I'm caught in this weird place where it's like, I want to take him, but I also don't want the headache and hassle and responsibility of taking him because I'm not quite sure that he's ready for it. Um, as I say, he's three years old, um, very, very active, doesn't want to sit still, doesn't want to be in one place. And the last thing I want is to deal with that during a really important game that I'm then expected to come away and report on and work on and talk about and analyse. So for me, he's somebody that um, he's somebody that I think needs to be tested first. And I think the best way uh, to do that is to take him to a game like the Emirates Cup or a charity game where if I do get a little bit distracted by him, if I do take my eyes off the game a little bit, I won't be too bothered or too fussed. Um, so yeah, I think that that I might try it in the uh, in the summer. Um, yeah, that might be his first game. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, Jiva says, "Give him your phone." Uh, worked for me, haha. When my son was four, yeah, it's a good idea. But the only thing is that the um, the signal inside the Emirates is terrible, so you'd have to download something, wouldn't you? Um, but yeah, um, Robert says as well, three is too young for a big game. Yeah, I, I wouldn't take him to a big game just because not because. I'm like scared or, or anything, but because I feel like I would be half on him and half on the game. And I don't want that. Like when I go to a big game, I want to be focused on the game. I want to be focused on it and then come home and do my work around it as opposed to being sort of like one eye on the kid. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree with you. Three years too young for a big game. Charity game, an Emirates Cup game. You might just get away with it, but we'll see closer to the time. OK, uh, I think I'm going to leave it there because we've been going for about 46, 47 minutes. Thank you all so, so much um, for for joining me. Really, really do appreciate it. Um, it's always great to see so many of you in the live chat. And and, and I really do uh, love interacting with you guys. Uh, I just got to bring this up. NSW says, when did you start your music career with Neymar? Have you guys won a Grammy yet? Check out the tweet that I retweeted yesterday where I think it was Jay. Um, posted a picture of a guy up on stage with Neymar who, at first glance, I have to admit, looks a bit like me. Uh, but yeah, uh, I wish I had a big booming music career with uh, Neymar by my side. That would be quite something. But thank you all again, as I say, for, for tuning in. It is very, very much appreciated. Don't forget to hit that like button if you haven't done so already. And please do subscribe to the channel if you're new uh, as we continue to move forward um also if you're listening via the audio platforms please do leave us a review particularly if you're on apple Podcasts. it really does help i'll be back soon with more until then take care of yourselves all the best goodbye i'm martin tyler and you're listening to harry Simeon.